Hi guys, and welcome to a bonus Underworld podcast episode. I'm your host, Sean Williams. Uh, thanks so much to our subscribers, and I'm guessing this is one show that you're really going to be interested in. So joining us from New York is Keegan Hamilton. He's a senior reporter at Vice News, and he's been spending the last few days or so in Brooklyn for the trial of uh, Genaro Garcia Luna, who is Mexico's former top security official and who is also unincidentally accused of taking massive bribes from the Sinaloa cartel. So first of all, thanks for joining us, Keegan. I guess let's start at the very beginning. Who is this guy and, and why is this case so important? As you just said, he's the former senior most or top security official in Mexico. He served as the secretary of public security under President Felipe Calderon in, in Mexico from 2006 to 2012. Uh, and before that, he was uh, Garcia Luna was the head of sort of the Mexican equivalent of the, the FBI. And it, it's important because he is the highest ranking Mexican official to ever go on trial in the United States on narco corruption. So this case, are, the stakes are extremely high for the U.S. to, to get a conviction and, and prove that they can you know, hold allegedly corrupt Mexican officials to justice. What, what, what exactly are the charges then leveled at him? Basically, he's accused of, for years, taking massive bribes from uh, the Sinaloa cartel to, in exchange for protecting their, their drug trafficking activities and leaking them sensitive intelligence, including intel from uh, the U.S. DEA. Garcia Luna you know, oversaw Mexico's federal police, as well as their ports, their prisons, he had a very, very important role. And so if, in fact, the cartel did successfully pay this guy off, uh, it was probably a good investment because he could have really made it easier for them to uh, get their drugs through the country and also to sort of target their rivals with information that he was providing. And and, and so this, is, this trial has been going on for a, a short while now, and... Who are the kind of key players that we've heard from testifying at this point, and who's who's kind of dished out the most sort of explosive or interesting testimony? The trial's been going on for a few weeks now, and what's I think most interesting about it is that the U.S. prosecutors don't seem to have much in the way of hard evidence against this guy. There's there's as at least so far that we've seen no recordings, no videos no ledgers, nothing that's really like concrete evidence. What they do have is a lot of cooperators, like former high-level cartel guys and other corrupt officials who are you know, already sentenced in the U.S. or already, already had their cases done in the U.S. and they're now you know, testifying against this guy in the hopes that it'll get them out of prison sooner or get them some other benefits in the U.S. The most damaging one so far has been a guy nicknamed El Grande, who was a former lieutenant in the Beltron Leva organization, which is a, a faction of the Sinaloa cartel. And he's so far the only person, well, there's actually that back, one other who's claimed that he was there personally and witnessed uh, Garcia Luna taking these multi-million dollar bribes from the Beltron Leva, Leva organization. Everybody else pretty much has had sort of secondhand accounts. Like I heard from somebody else in the cartel that this guy was on the payroll, more, more or less. And, and there's also this uh, Oscar Nava Valencia as well, who's like a lobo, um, the wolf. Um, he's kind of painted this scene of Garcia Luna taking like a $3 million bribe at a car wash. You've been hearing this testimony. I mean, how does it kind of strike you? Is it is it a bit fantastical? Or, I mean, how has it kind of gone down in the courtroom? Yeah, Lobo Valencia is the the other guy who, who has claimed to have you know, personally been involved in a, a bribe payment and it it is in some ways pretty pretty like surreal testimony what they're describing like garcia luna when he was in office in mexico was a very famous person he was the like literally the face of mexico's drug war against the cartels uh i i can't think of a good equivalent in the united states because they're really there really isn't one who, who is as high profile as him and as well known as he was in Mexico at the time. So the idea that this guy could just go to a car wash and hop into a high ranking cartel members vehicle and that no bystanders would notice or or raise alarms about that. It, it sort of strange strains credulity. But 
at the same time, the way that other witnesses have sort of described the unusual ways of, of Garcia Luna doing this, it, it seems like they sort of may, if it is true, in fact, maybe they were just taking advantage of the fact that, that nobody would dare to speak up or that nobody would believe their own eyes if they saw Garcia Luna out in public with, with some of these individuals. And there have been other witnesses who gave accounts that were, frankly, really stretched, stretched the limits of, of like what's believable. Uh, like one guy claimed that uh, part of this, one of the big incidents that's come up repeatedly in the trial is that Garcia Luna was uh, supposedly kidnapped by uh, the leader of the Beltran Leva organization uh, for not keeping up his end of the bargain with the bribes, for not taking their side in a, a war against another faction of the Sinaloa cartel, led by El Chapo. And there's one witness who claims that he saw this kidnapping take place. And his version of the story is that he's, he's like a lower ranking cop and he just happens to be driving on a highway out of Mexico City and drives by at the exact moment when this kidnapping is taking place and he sees Garcia Luna and these two very famous cartel bosses standing on the side of the road uh <laughs> and then like witnesses that like there's a whole story that goes along with this but it just the fact that he happened to be there right at that moment is just like r really and there's no other proof of of this at all except for your your testimony i don't i don't know yeah it's it, it's strange to have a case that's got so little material evidence i mean has anything kind of profit at all is it just the testimony of sort of former associates and, and, and kind of officials. In terms of things that directly link Garcia Luna to cartel bribes, there has been really, really nothing. Like it's, it's witness testimony. We've had some hard evidence, but it's not directly related to Garcia Luna. For example, uh, one of the allegations is that after this alleged cartel kidnapping, word was getting out and he wanted to, to silence the Mexican press. So he allegedly went to his, a buddy of his who was a governor of uh, the Mexican state of Coahuila and said, hey, I know that you know the, the owner of Mexico's largest newspaper, El Universal. It would be great if you could ask him to give me some favorable press coverage and we can pay for that. And uh, another corrupt official who served under this governor uh, is cooperating with the U.S. He's, he's already been uh, arrested and had a case against him. And he brought uh, some of the paperwork from his government position with him to the U.S. And one of the things that he brought was this invoice for like 11 million pesos in change, just like 100 grand or so. Uh, and it's like marked for like tourism campaign for the state is what it's labeled. But he's like, actually, this was a payment to the newspaper on behalf of Garcia Luna to make sure that he looked good in the press and that this newspaper didn't cover this alleged kidnapping it's kind of when i've been reading some of the accounts of it all it it feels like everything in isolation is perfectly believable and you could see this kind of stuff happening from a day-to-day -day basis but put together it this it it, it it does seem a little weak at the moment i don't know what's what are your kind of takeaways on the strength of the case no it's it's been quite weak and and I mean, right now, the trial, when this trial started, the expectation was that it would stretch well into March. Um, the government had a list of, of dozens of witnesses that they were going to call. And just this past week, we've heard the news that the government has plans to rest their case uh, at least uh, two or three weeks sooner than they expected. Mm -hmm. And everybody's kind of scratching their heads and going, what, what happened with the, the other witnesses that you called? You know, and asking this, like, why, why isn't there more proof? There's it's not that they don't have a smoking gun, it's that they don't even have a gun. Yeah. And they're really counting on the fact that, that these witnesses are going to be found credible in the eyes of the jury. And I guess of all of the, the, the picture that it paints of all of these kind of fraternal struggles within the Sinaloa cartel and its various offshoots and, and how that all worked um, allegedly under the guise of Garcia Luna kind of giving patronage to whomever. Has there been any information that sheds light on that scene that we didn't already know, or is it kind of just sort of followed the narrative that, that I, many of us are kind of aware of? That, that's actually been one of the most interesting 
parts of this for me is the description of how the arrangements allegedly worked with Garcia Luna. And in the sort of the, the heyday of the Sinaloa cartel in the early 2000s up until around 2008, 2009, the leadership sort of was getting along well and working together. It was like truly a unified cartel. And in that era, everyone was sort of pooling their money together and delivering massive bribes to Garcia Luna so that everyone would benefit. Then, uh, as some of you may know, there's this feud that happens between the Beltran Leyva organization and El Chapo and El Mayo and, and that faction of the Sinaloa cartel. And once that fighting breaks out, there's a lot of pressure, allegedly, on Garcia Luna to, to pick a side and help one against the other. And he's sort of trying to remain neutral and, and play it, play both sides. And that's ultimately what allegedly got him kidnapped by Arturo Beltran Leyva is that he, he wouldn't pick a side. And so you can see how this arrangement's going peachy keen for a long time and many years. And then when the shit hits the fan, Garcia Luna's in this really awkward place of having to, to choose one cartel faction against another. And that, you know, if it is true, carries all sorts of risks for him at the time, because then it's, it's even, it would be even more obvious that he's on the take by helping, you know, blatantly helping one group against the other. It's so it sounds like it would make a great script for a sort of third Sicario movie, but maybe, <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a pretty crazy story. Um, I mean, there, there's some wild, there's been some wild scenes that are almost like, like, stranger than what you would see in the movies. It, one of the, the anecdotes was that, I think it was in 2007, there was this massive seizure of over 20 tons of cocaine in the Mexican port of Manzanillo. And uh, Lobo Valencia and the witness El Grande both testified about how Garcia Luna helped them uh, with this ruse to sort of steal the cocaine from the Mexican government by creating all of these fake cocaine bricks made from sugar and flour that they package to look exactly like real cocaine. And then Garcia Luna lets them drive this truck full of fake cocaine into the port, swap out the, the dummy bricks for the real ones, <laughs> and then drive the 20 tons out that they then you know, resold and, and recoup their, their losses. Wow. Yeah, that is pretty crazy. Um, and so... This doesn't just stop. I mean, the buck just doesn't stop with Garcia Luna, allegedly. You know, say allegedly a hell of a lot in this show. But um, Felipe Calderon himself has been kind of implicated through the course of this trial. Um, how so, and what kind of credence should we be giving to that? Yeah, at the beginning of this trial, I think everyone who's following it, especially the the Mexican press, was really waiting anxiously for this bombshell to drop about uh, Felipe Calderon and how he was you know, corrupt and helping the, the Sinaloa cartel. There's a lot of theories about that. There's some circumstantial evidence that the Sinaloa cartel was less affected by you know, Mexico's militarized drug war under Calderon. But so far, the trial hasn't quite delivered on that. There's only been one witness, uh, a guy named Edgar Betia, who was the the former attorney general of the Mexican state of Nayarit. Uh, he's nicknamed El Diablo, which is a fun one. Uh, Legit the devil. law enforcement uh, official. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he, he had this sort of really secondhand story that he told where he's like, the governor went to a meeting in Mexico City with Calderon and Garcia Luna and came back and told me that those guys had said, we need to help El Chapo's side. And mm. it's like, he's not even at this meeting. Like he doesn't even know if Calderon himself was at this meeting. It's a really like secondhand account and that's it. That's, that's all he, he really had to say about it. And that we haven't seen any, anything definitive that links Calderon to it. Calderon is, has issued forceful denials. I've interviewed Calderon myself and asked him about this a few years ago, uh, and he very vehemently denied it at the time. Uh, and I think if if the allegations against him are to be you know taken seriously and credibly, it's going to take more than the testimony that we heard uh, from this one witness that that wasn't even 
you know, there in the room when this these words were allegedly said. So, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty fractious sort of dangerous time for the Sinaloa cartel, kind of generally, right? With um, Ovidio Guzman's recent capture, um, it seems like there's quite a lot of stake within the cartel on this case potentially. Um, you know how how big a splash could this be making in in the kind of Mexican underworld? I think the the real implication here is if if Garcia Luna is acquitted, if the U.S. loses this case, what message that sends to corrupt officials in Mexico, and it sort of opens the door to impunity. I mean, right now there you know there had been this risk of like you know if I get caught, then the U.S. I could spend the rest of my life in in U.S. prison. Uh, we've already seen that sort of fracture a little bit that image of of like the u.s justice system with the the case of salvador cienfuegos the former national defense secretary of mexico who was arrested in the u.s in, in 2020 on corruption charges and then promptly released under pressure from mexico's government uh with the charges dropped so that was the first instance of like okay maybe the u.s can't actually be trusted to hold corrupt mexican officials accountable and if this case fails then it would take a lot for the U.S. to take the gamble of, of bringing charges against another corrupt official. So for the, the actual members of the Sinaloa cartel, uh, if Garcia Luna is acquitted, I think that that only helps them by enabling them to have the h- corruption at the absolute highest levels in Mexico's government. I mean, the assumption is, is already that they do have that, mm. uh, you know, across, you know, politics, courts, military, police. Uh, We know that there is, you know, endemic corruption in Mexico, but without accountability for somebody like Garcia Luna, I I think that there's, it sort of opens the floodgates even more for the cartel to, you know, continue corrupting anybody and everybody in Mexico who who could benefit them. Uh, Give us an idea of like how it is to follow this case from day to day. I mean, I see that there's You've posted online like the the crazy media scrum that kind of follows each major player coming out of the courtroom. Is it is it a, a thriller a thriller minute experience court reporting? I I mean I sense I know the answer to this because I've done it a few times myself. <laughs> yeah, you're you're chuckling because you know that it can be dreadfully boring sometimes <laughs> yeah. uh, sitting in court. I mean, the cooperator witnesses, the ex cartel guys, um, tend to be interesting like their unique personalities some of them have sort of like mystique around them um and they tell crazy stories like the the one that i told you about you know stealing 20 tons of cocaine from the mexican government that is sort of like the edge of your seat testimony that you gotta you wait for but in between that there's a lot of boring stuff there's procedural law stuff there's you know law enforcement or expert witnesses who are sometimes testifying about really technical matters. Um, so it's not that it's always boring, but there is a lot of boring stuff that you got to sit through for the interesting part. And I think what's interesting about this high profile case, especially compared to like the El Chapo trial, for example, is that the media attention is almost entirely from Mexican press. I am one of the few US based American reporters in the courtroom and one of the only U.S. journalists who's, who's really writing about this really? story because yeah. I think it's important and I think there needs to be more coverage of it because Garcia Luna was working super close with the DEA, the FBI, the CIA, all of these agencies. And the question for me is how did the U.S. government either not know that this guy was super corrupt or how was the decision made to, to sort of turn a blind eye and just work with him make the best of the situation right it feels like it feels like these high profile especially on the official side high profile cases are such a game of chicken for the kind of u.s authorities right because they have to they want to send a message essentially that no one is above no one is above the law when it comes to sort of shipping these gigantic quantities of drugs and causing so much sort of pain and anguish in mexico and abroad but by the same token if they don't get it right they're they're, they're kind of stepping their foot in it and and creating exactly the environment they're trying to to stop. So, um, 
it's like on a moral side, you hope they get a <laughs> conviction in this case, I guess, but it sounds like it's pretty flimsy. Um, yeah. No, the stakes are the stakes are very high. I mean, like I said earlier, we, if this if this case fails, it's going to take a whole lot for them, the U.S. government, to ever bring another case against a high level Mexican official. Not just you know because it would be embarrassing that they they lost this case, but I mean, think of all of the resources that have gone into this trial. It, if it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's 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 potentially millions that have been spent on. You know, moving all these witnesses around and paying for the lawyers, everything that goes into this trial, it's it's just a lot. And, you know, a loss here is it's embarrassing. It's potentially like a waste of resources. And and like we were saying earlier, the message that it sends to, you know, the cartels and corrupt officials in Mexico is basically like, hey, we're it's open season. We can we can do whatever we want because nobody's going to hold us accountable. Yeah. Well, um. Hopefully we can come back to you in two or three weeks when this thing wraps up and and either there's been a spectacular failure or or some kind of a someone standing on the courtroom steps hailing a great victory for for the legal process. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> good luck in the meantime. I mean, I mean the conviction rate in in federal trials is like ninety eight percent or something like that. Virtually everyone who's charged in federal court either pleads guilty or gets convicted. So. The odds are in the government's favor, and I think that they were sort of counting on that going into this, that, you know, even if they couldn't, you know, in that game of chicken, convince this guy to plead guilty and, and not go to trial, Yeah, that if he did, that, you know, that they would win because they almost always do. Well, um, people can see your work at Vice News, obviously, and then wh where can they find you online and kind of keep abreast of, of your, of your uh, exploits at the courtroom as well? Yeah, I've been sort of every day that I'm in court, I've uh, been publishing a live thread on Twitter with updates. Uh, there's no electronics in the courtroom, so I got to sort of run run out of the courtroom and get down <laughs> to the media room on my break and uh, share the information uh, as quickly as I can. But follow me on Twitter at, at Keegan underscore Hamilton uh, for that sort of day to day detailed coverage of what's happened in the courtroom. Cool. Well, I'm hoping that Twitter survives the next couple of weeks to, uh, so we can even stay there. But um, anyway, thanks ever so much, Keegan, for joining us. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch and, and, and find out what's happening further down the line. Mm -hmm.